Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. Um, I think we can all agree Steve Markle deserves an Oscar if an Oscar was going to be given for videos. Uh, that was fantastic. <laughs> Um, <clears throat> as you probably guessed, I'm not Jonathan Tepperman, uh, the editor-in-chief of Foreign Policy uh, magazine. He was unable to make it because uh, of uh, flight conditions in New York. Uh, the same applies to the Secretary of the Navy, Richard Spencer. Both gentlemen um, send their apologies, um, matters out of their control. Um, however, I'm very pleased uh, to have such an excellent panel to, uh, to discuss this, this interesting subject. And it's the, the interesting nature of this subject I'll come to in a second. But first of all, I'd like to welcome uh, Mark Allen, the president of Boeing. Uh, thank you, Mark, for being here again uh, at Halifax. Um, Tolu Ogunlesi, special assistant to the president uh, of Nigeria on digital and new media. It's great to have you here and to have your perspective uh, on, this, on this vital matter. Um, Janice Stein, a regular right from the beginning at the Halifax International Security Forum. Janice um, is the Bellsberg Professor of Conflict Management and the founding director of the Monk School of Global Affairs at the University of Toronto. And like myself, um, uh, Rosa Brooks uh, has come in at the very last minute. Uh, thank you so much, Rosa. Rosa is a uh, professor of law at Georgetown University. She also wrote, for those of you who haven't yet, but certainly should read the um, op-eds in the program which have been circulated to the media, she wrote a fantastic op-ed on, um, on, uh, on, on the first panel uh, on Are We Winning? Rosa is also the author of uh, a book, How Everything Became War, and the military became everything. Certainly something as Christmas approaches to be put in the, uh, in the Christmas stocking. Um, I said that this is, this is an interesting title. It's actually something when people asked, even before I, I was going to be moderating this panel, asked about this panel, present tense, treachery in tech, trouble in trade. It's kind of hard to get your head around it. You don't immediately know what that is going to be about. And to me, as somebody who is uh, writing and researching a book on the digital revolution, uh, to me, that's very much the point, the point that it's not completely clear. Uh, in the research I've been doing in the last two years, I think I've read certainly every book that's come out in the last two years on politics and international affairs that's at least vaguely relevant to my subject. And you would be astounded how the words digital revolution or even the internet do not even make it to the, to the index of books on, on politics, domestic and international. It is to me quite extraordinary that this is going on amid a revolution. There are a few thoughts that, that I'd like to throw out um, to, the, to the panelists and to the audience before coming uh, to Janice Stein, who, who wrote the, the opening essay uh, for this panel. Um, I think what we're, what we're, we're reaching towards uh, in this discussion is the sense that since technology overlaps with both trade and the military, to what extent has digital transformed the hard power element of the hard power versus soft power dichotomy that Joseph Nye made famous? And, and hard power, if you remember, is the idea of how you can get people to bend to your will. Uh, and usually that's the use of military force or the threat of military force, the use of economic power. And that is, is contrasted with soft power, uh, the sense in which the, the way in which your society is socially, politically, culturally attractive draws people in. And, and that dichotomy was very famously made by, by Joseph Nye, but it was made in an era before digital had really taken off. Uh, and I find it very interesting, this sense in which we, we ha we're having to really rethink our most fundamental paradigms paradigms in international affairs, whether it be international politics or international economics. There's also the question, you see this, this, this rather uh, potentially elusive title, treachery in tech, trouble in trade, treachery in tech. High tech bears the indelible stamp made in America. You can argue the toss about uh, who invented the internet. I'm British, so it was Tim Berners-Lee. Um, uh, lots of countries can, can claim the, the invention of the television. There are at least five or six countries claim the invention of the television. Um, what is absolutely indisputable is that Silicon Valley has been the place in which the digital revolution was made concrete, made real, uh, and, and influenced uh, the world. Um, so to what extent do the commercial interests of these great tech companies conflict with American and Western strategic interests? And this does speak to the treachery part of the title. Facebook, Google, and so on are money-making outfits, but they do business in and with Russia and China. They are bound to see these nations, both strategic rivals to the United States and the West, as customers. 
if customer is king, then to whom are they truly loyal? And what happens when loyalties conflict? In the previous panel, um, the two senators referred uh, to, to China and to how, and I was watching today on CNN how President Trump was saying, they're going to do a deal, they're going to do a deal with us. Um, trouble in trade is inevitably a consequence of what I was just talking about because tech is also a business. But President Trump, perhaps more so than any previous president or certainly any president in, in recent memory, has made... Uh, I, I, wouldn't say uh, I wouldn't say trade a weapon, but he certainly used American muscle to advance a trade agenda. Now, how far is the United States prepared to take this is a question that relates to the element of the title, trouble in trade, what are the dangers? But might President Trump actually pull all this off? You know, it's very easy to criticize the President of the United States for, often for his rhetoric, but he's forged a deal with Canada. It looks like there's probably something coming up with the European Union. Um, China, uh, as, at least if you believe Trev President Trump's words, is ready to come to the table. The terms of trade might potentially actually be, be moved in America's favor. Now, these are the issues to be thrown out. These are not my opinions. These are the issues that I think inevitably arise in such a discussion. And I'd like to start off with Janice. Uh, and, and coming back to that hard power, uh, soft power dichotomy, to what extent has technology become the key point of strategic rivalry in a kind of 21st century great game? You know, I, I don't think there's, and I'm, I'm actually astonished, Robin, that you read books on global <laughs> politics. I, I, I almost can't Absolutely. believe it. <laughs> <laughs> that technology is absent and digital technology is absent from those discussions. So if we think about uh, the digital revolution that we've gone through and the artificial intelligence and big data analytics that we are in the early stages, and those are different, uh, they will provide the platforms for both hard and soft power. So those concepts remain relevant, but the, but the platforms on which that power will be launched uh, will be, in fact, all digital. You know, I, when I talk about a car, and we've just concluded a trade deal. Uh, I, I'm trying to find the right word to describe the negotiation, so I won't. Because um, uh, <laughs> there really isn't one. But that trade deal was fundamentally a backward-looking trade deal. It was about uh, trade in goods and, and in services, uh, not, it didn't really look forward at the kind of economy and the kind of security challenges that we're going to face. Those are all, and, and this is a truism to say with the two of you and with Rosa here, scale, being able to scale big data is the currency of the future. And it's the economic currency of the future, and it's the currency for security of the future. And if we don't think very hard about how those two intersect, we're going to confront some very interesting problems. A friend of mine in Silicon Valley asked me this week, how comfortable would the House and the Senate of the United States be with an autonomous vehicle made entirely in China driving on North American highways? I see by your face. <laughs> That raises almost all the issues that you put on. And who programs that car? Who controls that car? Is that car an economic threat? Uh, is the car a security threat? And in fact, um, we could have a very rich discussion arguing that it's both. The second fundamental point is that as we look forward, China will have an enormous advantage in scale, which is critically important to big data analytics. Um, it has an enormous advantage in scale because it has unprecedented amounts of data from 1.4 billion people. No American technology company has access to that kind of data. And in fact, given the New York Times story on Facebook uh, yesterday and today, it's very unlikely that Facebook will be able to operate with as much freedom as it has had in the past. Mm. So you're, you're actually seeing uh, an asymmetrical shift on which big data will be collected. It will be far easier for China to scale that big data. It is already doing so. 
Um, and we are in a very different world already with profound challenges to national security and to the economy. This bears almost nothing to do with the trade agenda um, that we've just spent 14 agonizing months talking about. Mm. I'm going to come back to the, the, the point you raised about how the United States can't compete with China simply because China has greater numbers. Oh, I didn't say that. I well, said it's going to be a big challenge. It's going to be a big challenge. Yes. Because one of the issues is that if, we, if Western countries actually come together on this, uh, and, and f forge a kind of sp a digital space, we may not be able to reach 1.4 billion, but we can certainly reach a lot more than the United States' population on its own. But hold that thought for a moment. I wanted to bring in um, Mark Allen, president of Boeing. This issue that I, I raised in the, in, the, in, the, in the thoughts that I was throwing out at the beginning of companies which uh, have uh, a loyalty to their shareholders, they must provide value to their shareholders, but also are involved in strategically important industries, such as the industry that Boeing is in. How do you navigate that challenge when you're, you, you, know, you have a loyalty to the United States of America, to Western democracy, uh, to the NATO alliance in the sense as, as, a, as a person, as a citizen, and, and perhaps many of your employees in your companies, and yet you have to provide shareholder value. What, what, what are the, 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 the difficulties in navigating that when it comes to strategic rivals like China and Russia, but potentially others as well? You know, I think to understand what motivates a, a, a company, you need to listen very clearly to what the vision and the mission is for the company. So our vision and our mission is simple. It's to connect, protect, explore, and inspire the world through aerospace innovation. And, uh, and that becomes a uniter for us that helps orient us across all of our stakeholders, whether it be shareholders or customers or suppliers or governments. Now, what's different is, of course, the connect leads to protect. The protect piece of our mission is different from a lot of industries. We operate in the domain of, uh, of enabling and assisting in the national security mission. Uh, and so that, is, that requires a different form, uh, I think, of measured, uh, measured responsibility. And so if you see uh, Boeing in the United States, you will see Boeing as a loyal uh, supplier, a loyal partner to the United States in the security mission. If you look in the United Kingdom and you see Boeing there, you'll see the same thing. Boeing Defense UK is the UK's Boeing. It's a, it is a Britishized Boeing to develop and deliver national security uh, capability for Britain. In Australia, same thing. And so as you look around the world to where we have our defense, uh, our localized defense companies, they're operating very much inside the spectrum of the responsibility, the commitment uh, to the nation there and to the nation's security mission. Now back on the commercial side is where we engage, of course, with the whole world. And we sell airplanes. Uh, across uh, 90 different countries. Uh, and so you can imagine that that's a very different uh, customer set because we sell to countries who are both in the alliance and outside the alliance. And the alignment there, the commitment there is to global prosperity. We have all together grown and prospered because of the ability to intersect technology with fundamental human needs. And so the need to travel and the need to connect for commerce, for human-to-human -human interaction, and for everything else has driven enormous, enormous profitability into the aerospace industry, which has created jobs, which has created support for states all around the world. Uh, and, and so that model of the prosperity supporting the state and enabling the state to pursue its important missions, including security, is one in which we, we are inextricably tied. Mm. And yet, if you step back, you have, to, you have to see a couple things. Number one, over the last five years, aerospace globally has grown at about an 8% per year growth rate. Think about the CAG around that for just passenger traffic. That's just seats filled with human beings flying every single day. 80% mm. of the world, though, has never been on an airplane. 80%. So the growth that's still in front of us is also extraordinary. But it's also why the business has changed so much over the last several, several decades. Because in 2000, 35% of our business or thereabouts was done outside the US. Today, that number is about 85%. And so that radical shift in who we serve and who the commercial customer is and who the defense customer is, because now our defense business is about 50-50 US, non-US. Uh, that radical shift has changed how we have to think about engagement with governments everywhere. And so to really to the bottom line of your question, uh, we can never enter a market without first having to assess what we're doing there, what's the mission. And if it's a protect mission, then it's very easy to understand loyalty to that mission. 
And where it's the Connect mission, the commercial aerospace, it's a global, it's a global industrial effort. Mm. And so we have partners that work with us all over the world, and that creates a stability. A stability which, frankly, stands in the middle of a time that's really quite turbulent. Uh, and a stability that enables uh, governments, even when they're locked in a pitch struggle with one another over economic or security or other issues, to find a common ground and a place to meet and to talk and to engage. And so our productive engagement in places like China and Russia has been a very important part of the story of the U.S. Uh, bilateral to those nations being able to find a place of, uh, of mutual benefit and mutual interest in continuing to talk and to engage. Right, and it, it, what may be obvious to you uh, may well not be obvious to many of us here and certainly not to me. So at the risk of trying your patience, that Boeing is, is, is itself a, a high-tech company, very high-tech company. Uh, it, it is also a, an American company. Um, what restrictions do you face when it comes to, I mean, obviously you sell and you, you've, your planes fly all over the world. What restrictions do you face in terms of legislation from the United States, from, from other Western countries, in terms of what you can make available to countries such as Russia and China and other countries around the world. How do you, I mean, you have presumably a code of ethics in, in Boeing that you've talked about, but also what, what actually can you and can you not do? Well, it's not just the United States. So, we, so wherever we develop technology, it lives underneath trade control rules. Mm -hmm. And of course, sanction rules also apply on what, where we can do commerce and what we can and cannot do. You know, as one small example, Boeing was named, in, of course, in the JCPOA. We're the only company, the only industry named, and you know, it was very much a part of the deal between the governments uh, looking for airplanes to be a part of that, uh, that effort to bring Iran back into global economic engagement. Mm. Uh, and of course, when the GCPOA fell, all of the, uh, the push from the governments for Boeing to go sell airplanes turned into pull for Boeing not to go sell airplanes. Mm. And what do we do? On both sides, we look to the government and we follow the government. So it's very straightforward. The sanctions rules, the trade control rules, at the end of the day, they're all discernible. Mm -hmm. They're all measurable, and we follow them. Right, so there's essentially a geography out there that's set for you, and then you just do the best you can as a company Correct. with what's, what's available to you. Correct, and so the, the commercial geography is set in one place, and the national security geography is set in a narrower place. Right. Um, Tolu uh, Ogunlesi um, uh, from Nigeria. Uh, one angle of, of, of what's going on in terms of international trade, but also technology, but also the, 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 China, uh, the, the growing influence of China around the world that is often missed is the, is the, is the increasing <coughs> presence of China in Africa. Um, uh, I was saying just before we came on that one of my um, strategies as a child in the game of Monopoly, if you know the game of Monopoly, was simply buy everything. Uh, and it's a strategy that meant I always won at Monopoly. Um, it seems to me that's the Chinese, uh, the Chinese approach in a nutshell. Just buy everything and then you'll have lots of influence and you win the game. What, what are you actually seeing? I mean, you can read about this in The Economist. You can read about it uh, in lots of places about Chinese um, uh, encroachment, Chinese development in China. What does it actually look like in Nigeria? What does Chinese development and, and movement into Africa look like? Um. So in, in Nigeria, at the moment, we are um, building a national rail network to connect the entire country. A uh, hundred years after the British built, left, you know, a network. Um, and it's the Chinese who are building that, that network. Um, uh, it's going to be, you know, several billion dollars worth of, of contracts. But I think that from the African perspective, it just feels like one more option. Um, you know, there was something that uh, Kwame Nkrumah, the first prime minister and president of Ghana, said um, in the 60s, uh, we face neither east nor west, we face forward. And I think that that sentiment, you know, still continues to, I think for, um, it's still an important sentiment that um, now we have another option. And so for many countries, it's, um, it's an opportunity to be able to deal with east and west, and see what you can get out of it. Um, and you know, quite interestingly, just, just this week, uh, in the papers in Nigeria, it was announced that um, GE, the American company, was pulling out of um, a deal to rehabilitate the old rail network in Nigeria. You know, so what you find is, um, you know, it, it, on, on the one hand, you find that there's enthusiasm from China to, to invest, to do business. 
But um, you know, in, 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 on the other hand, you find that the U.S., for example, is seems not very keen, you know, to do to to to, to offer the same kind of services. Uh, but you know, for for a government like Nigeria that needs investment, that needs um, uh, infrastructure, you go with what's available. You know, so it's um, it's it's. I think that that line of you know we 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 face neither east nor west. There's no. It, we're not very ideological about these things. It's about the need, and that need is, look, you've got to build stuff uh, for a population that is growing. In, by 2050, Nigeria is going to be the third most populous country in the world, after India and China. You know, um, it's one of the youngest populations in the world. Uh, half of the population is under 20. You know, so I'm optimistic that, look, we're looking at a potential world power, and so we need electricity, we need um, rail lines, we need all that stuff, and we will get it wherever we, uh, we, we can. Do, do you think that, um, I mean, Chinese investment, I mean, does it come with a price tag in the sense, obviously, there's a, there's a financial price tag. Does it come with a political price tag? Do you, do you feel that Nigeria feels a little less inclined to be critical of China, if it was in, inclined to be critical of China anyway? Do you feel that the, the, the extent of the investment makes Nigeria a friend of China? Well, you know, if you pay attention to Western media, um, there is a big cost to Chinese involvement in Africa. But from the point of view of African countries, um, it, it, it feels like, look, we, we dealt with the West for decades. In, in um, 2005, Nigeria paid um, $18 billion uh, to, the, to, to Western powers, um, the Paris and London clubs, to get debt forgiveness. You know, it's the biggest, it's probably the biggest payment ever by a, de a, a developing country to get debt forgiveness. Um, this, so at the point, we owed the Western powers $30 billion, you know, and uh, interest payments took up all of our, of our earnings. You know, so there, there's been a long and not particularly nice history with the West over decades that makes it feel like any um, the sentiments of the West that China is coming as some kind of predatory uh, lender and all that just feels you know like an argument that you know that that the West does not have the legitimacy mm -hmm. to make you know um, and and so it's, it's it, it sounds a bit alarmist for us you know I, I see it all the time you know um, you see the headlines about how uh, some country in Africa has had to give up all its ports to the Chinese and all that. But it, it's not clear to me that we're getting a worse deal from China than we got from the West. Right. Well, that's a fascinating point. Yeah. And I can assure you yeah. that most people, certainly that I know in Washington, D.C. and London, do not get that point. Yeah. So thank you for raising it. And, and I'll certainly come back to, to that in a second. Rosa Brooks, um, <clears throat> I left off with, with Janice about this uh, point about big data and how China has the, uh, uh, as, as Janice put it, essentially it has the upper hand in the sense that it has a 1.4 billion population. And uh, not that that means that the United States or the West is helpless, but it's going to be a bit more of a, of a challenge uh, to take on. Um, uh, how do you see um, the rivalry, the sense of rivalry between the United States and China and the West generally and China in terms of a new great game. Do you think that this is, this is real or is this just kind of the, the sort of headline mm. that everyone likes to, to put on something to categorize it? Is, is it really a battle or is it really just a bunch of tech companies who are fighting it out as commercial companies do? I, that's a great question, and I'm not sure that we really know the answer. I mean, you said something earlier in part of your, your question to Janice. You, you asked, you know, how far would Donald Trump go with the trade? Will he go all the way? And, and, and I think one of the questions still on the table is, is precisely that. I think in many arenas we've seen on the, on the U.S. side under this administration uh, uh, inflammatory rhetoric which at the end of the day is not matched by, uh, by action, or, or, or indeed you get some inflammatory action, but then two weeks later, rather quietly, it's walked back because we, we create waivers and carve-outs and exceptions. Um, so I think the, to the extent that it is possible to say that there has been a trend under President Trump, which is, which is not easy, um, that one of those trends has been that the, the, at the end of the day, the U.S. Uh, 
escalation and, and uh, inflammatory actions don't end up amounting to as much as it sounds like they will. Um, I certainly think the Chinese are doing their best to keep things from escalating. Um, so, you know, th there, there's the optimistic scenario here is that there's a lot of posturing right now, uh, and that's, that's natural, and it's not necessarily a bad thing insofar as it fuels healthy competition, uh, and it pushes both states to be at the top of their game. I think, I think Tolu's point uh, is a really inc powerful one for the West altogether, obviously, that, that when you look at the West record in, in, in Africa in particular, it's not exactly sterling, but I think you could broaden that out to saying, uh, coming out of the last panels, we talk about the, the sort of decline of US leadership in particular and maybe Western cohesion and leadership in general, is that, and we're all inclined to mourn that because most of us in this room uh, come from the West, whatever that means, but not all of us. And, and it's a good question to ask, is that bad for the world or is it just bad for us? Is it just bad for the West? Because maybe it's just bad for the West. Um, and maybe being pushed to step up our game a little bit by the specter that if we don't start paying a little bit more attention, uh, China is likely to displace us as the, as the prime mover. Maybe, maybe that's not such a bad thing either for others or, or ultimately for us. Um, I also, I did want to go back really briefly to another question that you asked at the very beginning about uh, hard power, soft power. And uh, um, one of the things that I think is, is most fascinating that it is, is tied up in all these questions in a really fascinating way um, is the degree to which the, the recent um, emergence uh, of, what well, I don't know what to call them, well, actually, I'll take a step back, right? When we think about war, everyone knows the famous line from Clausewitz that uh, uh, war is politics by other means. Another way to say that is that war, physical force, violence, that's what you do when you can't figure out any other way to achieve your political objectives. Increasingly, not only states but non-state actors have a wide range of other means to achieve their, direct, their objectives, political objectives, short of physical violence. Violence has more competition. Uh, if you are China, whether, whether you're ISIS or whether you're China or whether you're a, a Russian hacker uh, or whether you're, you're, you're an individual out for your own profit, uh, why bother with force if you can, through hacking, through other mechanisms, uh, or if you're China, through you know, embedding code in the, in the fully automated cars, if you can find all sorts of more subtle ways to coerce and control and cause confusion, it, it, it does start maybe to displace uh, hard power techniques. It's not exactly soft power. It's not the attractive lore of an appealing culture by any stretch of the imagination. It's still, it, it is explicitly coercive in intent but it's also not reliance on violence. Does that make the world a better place? Uh, uh, I don't know. Um, it certainly makes the world a more, a more dangerous place right now, not least, and, and this again goes back to um, what I was saying about Trump and uh, escalatory rhetoric, uh, not least because we don't know how to control all of this. None of us know how to control all of it. And we see a lot of actors from China and Russia to the United States itself playing games in that arena where we, you know, you call it gray zone, you call it whatever you want, where, where everyone is sort of making little forays to see where the threshold is at which other great powers will actually respond. Um, and so far, everyone has behaved very well and resisted the temptation to respond to provocations in that gray zone. But there's always the possibility, whether it's, whether it's with actual physical force or whether it's in, in other arenas, that we inadvertently end up escalating into a really significant great power conflict. Right, yeah. and I think it's, I'll bring Janice in in a second, and it's interesting picking up one of the points you raised about this gray zone is that well, the gray zone is full of things that we don't yet know. Uh, we don't, we're not yet aware what, they're, what these technologies are capable of. And one of the issues that, that is, is, is uh, I guess, is going to determine whether 
we do make this bridge from soft to hard power is whether hacking, for example, and this brings in artificial intelligence, you can actually start firing off other people's military systems. Yep. Right. I mean, this yep. is when, you know, you yep. don't have to invade a country, but if you can start blowing up right. uh, their, their missile facilities just by sitting in front of a keyboard, uh, then this transforms... Or just the, confusing them. Yeah, or just confusing them, yeah. making them think an attack's happening, but maybe it isn't. That, Janice? That's, a good, that's actually exactly where uh, I wanted to go. And just to be deliberately provocative, if we think forward 10 or 15 years and we make these breakthroughs in artificial intelligence uh, that many people are talking about, and, and there the United States um, currently has a strong advantage still. I think what's changing for everyone is tech is not neutral. I think we're coming off 15 years where we thought of technology as neutral. And I think we're at the end of this period now, and we understand that it's not neutral. Uh, what do you specifically mean by not being neutral? In the sense that the, the, the edge of the technological revolution where we are Virtually all of it has what we, I would say in older language is dual use technology. Right. From a, a programmed car to a programmed person with artificial hearts and uh, other artificial parts. These are potentially all dual use technologies in the world we're moving into. So for companies like Marx, these, this last 20 years in, in some ways was the golden era. It was globalization, it was governments pulling back, regulation was pulled back, and certainly you can argue that it contributed to global prosperity. I think we're at the end of that now. Uh, because we have, all technology will be, do you, will be dual use. Once that happens, and I think we're gonna see it very soon with some of the big tech companies that currently exist, uh, governments will be back in a big way. Um, and so what we talk about is economic nationalism. Um, well, I, I think... I, I'm gonna have to jump in here in just a second, Janice. <laughs> <laughs> I know, well, but uh, let me make your world worse, all right? I wanna make it worse than you think I'm gonna make it. Uh, economic nationalism is actually gonna deepen because governments are gonna regulate, and this is not new. We've had periods, even in US history, where governments regulated companies that were, in, that were American headquartered companies, but, but worked Dennis, multinationally. Just before Mark does jump in, I mean, what's wrong? Mark came up with a statistic that I think everyone will take home with them, or amongst many others this weekend, that 80% of the world's population has not been on an airplane. Well, since we're part of the 20% that has, why shouldn't they? I don't think that's the challenge. I, you know, I just, when people, I, I, when people ask me, I describe a car as a computer dressed up in a steel dress, right? So it's not that the other 80% of the world should not have access to civilian airliners, but the technology that goes into civilian airliners is not neutral. It's all dual use technology. And governments are gonna look at this in an entirely different way than they have in the last 15 years. And companies are gonna face, even the highest tech companies are gonna face regulatory challenges from governments that, we, that would have been inconceivable five years ago. So, so the, the place You're where- You're gonna need a very large government relations department. <laughs> They've probably got one. <laughs> you already have one. Yeah, and that's, that's actually right to the point where, where I depart from uh, the logic uh, from my perspective. Um, because the reality is that it, it has not been the case that government has pulled back from industry. So, so just to take the simplest case, if, uh, if you own an airline and you thought you wanted to compete with the, uh, the, the incumbent and that uh, a new business class seat would be just the ticket to get the right passengers, you would spend about three years going through the certification <laughs> process. That's government engaged deeply, more deeply than ever before, for good reasons, but deeply engaged in industry. But not across the high tech sector. In well, your industry, yes. So, so what's happened in my view uh, is that we have come into a space where what we are facing is simply math. And we have not known how to classify math as a thing before. And so if you read through the ITAR, which is the US restrictions on munitions, or if you read through the EAR, which is U.S. restriction on dual use technologies, they are oriented towards things, mm -hmm. not towards math. That's right. Math is absolutely, it's like DNA. You can't separate DNA from the person. You can't separate math from anything. And as algorithms, 
and the deployment of those algorithms across physical realities becomes a unique technology that's needed to win, regardless of whether that's a security win or an industrial win, there, will, there needs to be a concerted effort to understand how to regulate math. Now, the problem is that capacity does not exist in government today. That's right. And so government will try to regulate, but right now it is simply not configured or geared to regulate. So it's a very interesting space we're coming into. And, and the only other place I, I depart from your logic but is I don't, agree. just to finish my thought, please. <laughs> the place where I depart from you is I don't think the US is, in fact, in front when it comes to AI. And they've seen a number of studies that would disagree with you on that point. So it's actually, it's a, it's a more present and more immediate question for all of us mm -hmm. about how governments will think from a yeah. national security perspective yeah. about regulating math. But that's, but that's like regulating air. It's but that's, interesting to watch I think go. that's exactly the challenge that we're talking about. How do governments regulate math? Because it's not only algorithms, it's also big data analytics that are based on scale. Can I, can I take that even a step further? I and that's an even more dystopian uh, possible future here. Um, I agree with Mark. I don't think governments are very good at this. No. And I think that we are not quite at a stage, but we are almost at a tipping point where, where certainly the, the tech giants um, are going to get, they're not too big to fail, but too big to regulate and too globalized to regulate in any effective way. I think we're already seeing governments uh, flailing around trying to figure out how you regulate them. And we have not yet reached, a, we're still at a moment, Mark, when most uh, executives of US tech companies um, like you say, I'm, I'm an American citizen. Um, I do have a personal loyalty to the United States and we consider ourselves a US corporation and we care about US laws and we care about US national security imperatives. I think we are this close to the moment when the Googles and Facebooks uh, uh, of the world say, I, that's nice that you think so, US government. That's nice that you think so, Chinese government. That's nice that you think so, EU. But we're global, and we don't actually have to listen to you. And, and, and I, I think that thinking about, when, when we talk about non-state actors today, usually our discussions have to do with, we think of terrorist organizations you know, or insurgent groups. But I think that the, the non-state actors that are going to present one of the, the deepest challenges and some of the most interesting possibilities as well for creativity across national borders are going to be these enormous multinational corporations, particularly those that operate primarily in the math space rather than in the physical space, because we don't have the faintest idea how to bend them to the will of traditional nation state imperatives. But this well, is not just, the just to jump in, this is where I do you know, have to point out that in fact, companies act as reflections and manifestations of their communities. It is the employees yep. who are the people of the country. It is the suppliers who are the prosperity base of the country. It is the customers who are buying from this. And it is ultimately, the beautiful thing about democracy is there are these different constituent circles that all are working together. It's not just one big frame in which everything is planned and ordered. It is a messy mix of those circles working together. And that creates an incredible stickiness of loyalty and fealty. And so it doesn't matter whether or not it is Boeing demonstrating its commitment to the United States government, as we do day in and day out, or Boeing demonstrating its commitment to the Australian government when we have a security mission there day in and day out. I actually think that industry has proved itself over time to be much more reliable in this regard than you could ever imagine. Um, I, I don't actually think you're going to persuade any government of that argument when math moves, yeah. all right? I just don't. Um, and I understand why it's difficult to think about it this way. I, I agree entirely with Rose that governments are going to be terrible at this, frankly. But governments have been terrible at a lot of things for a long time, <laughs> but get it, all right? And they hire great people eventually when it becomes important enough and the imperatives are important enough. And when, as you say, math moves and you understand that it has significant security implications, you get your head around it with significant strategic investments at a government level. I think that's where we're moving. We can see how this is the beginning, not the end of it. There's no way that this discussion ends uh, in 11 minutes and 52 seconds time. This, this is, but this is very much the discussion. This is the agenda yeah. for the 21st century. It so is. The, the fact that we're, we are not going to arrive at a conclusion right. here is actually part of the story. It Ladies is. and gentlemen um, from the audience, please, uh, any questions? A gentleman over there.
Hello, I am uh, Mauricio Mechulam from the Mexico Research Center for Peace. And I wanted to bring uh, into the table the Mexican perspective uh, regarding, uh, regarding trade and regarding what's been said. And uh, I, I like very much the use of Klosevich because we uh, actually felt the, the threat of force being used in, in the sense of trade. But uh, I, I, I just want to point out that sometimes uh, even the threat of using force has consequences. In, in the case of the USMCA or the former NAFTA, it appears that we saved it, that it was saved last minute. But it could have not been saved. It, it, it could have happened that it was not saved. And, uh, and, and the use of these threats do have consequences. Now, so if, if, if you are applying this amount of threats or the use of force in global commerce against uh, the points that have been brought to the table, how, how do you see the possibility that things don't go as right and, and what would happen to the global economy sure. and global companies? Yeah, absolutely. The, the question about how these things can spiral out of control. Um, any other questions right, right this second? Uh, there's a gentleman at the back there. I know, behind you. Uh, I, I want, uh, sorry, my name is Nick Schifrin. I'm uh, the foreign affairs correspondent for PBS NewsHour, and I wanted to go back to big data and, and ask whether big data necessarily leads to big brother. Uh, and so that's a question about China, how China perhaps uses big data, but also how China will export some of this big data and some of the technology, and that brings up 5G. And so my question is, is 5G and the exporting of things like safe cities uh, a threat? And from the African perspective, if 5G is offered by China, would there be anything that would stop some of these countries from accepting it, uh, short of perhaps the United States having just as good an option? Thanks. Uh, Tolo, let's go to you first on, on that question about 5G uh, and Africa. Um, you know, uh, there's um, a concept in the Dr. Stein's essay um, that talked about, you know, I mean, so there's China, there's the US, and then the bystanders who will get hurt. Um, and I think I want to challenge that notion of, of bystander. Uh, increasingly, this, the, yesterday's bystanders are becoming today's active agents. Um, and technology is making that possible. So you think of sort of the uh, young kids in Macedonia who set up Facebook accounts that, um, uh, that ma to manipulate the elections in the US in 2016. You know, you think of, um, of the kind of innovation <coughs> in fintech that's happening on the African continent with SMS, you know, banking and all that stuff. You think of all that stuff and and you think about how easy it is, for example, to learn how to code now. You know, um, it just means that you have potentially, I think that whilst all the conversation is going on about the US and about China and Russia, the rest of the world isn't standing still. You know, people are getting more sophisticated. People are, um, you know, 5G, you know, it, 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 it took us in Nigeria forever to get mobile phones, yeah? but. 5G is probably going to come at a much faster, you know, it's not going to take the same length of time for us to move. Uh, we, we, we almost entirely skipped um, landlines, almost entirely, just went jump to mobile, you know, and I, I suspect that before we get 4G on, the, on, a, on a national scale, 5G is going to come up. So that's how fast um, stuff is moving. And um, if, if, for example, China offered so last week, I was, I was at the World Internet Conference by the Chinese government. Um, you know, and that tells a lot about how China itself wants to assert itself on the internet. You know, it was an exhibition of China's advancements in artificial intelligence, 5G, and all that. If, 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 the, if those technologies are offered to African countries, I don't see why they will not accept it. Um, a few, a few months ago, I listened to someone, an African uh, business person who owns one of the biggest telecoms companies on the continent, who said that um, the African telecom system or landscape would not be the same without Chinese companies. Because Chinese companies helped to break the monopoly of Western companies. 
you know, the Western companies, the Ericsson's, the Alcatel's came, you know, they were essentially monopolies at the beginning. And the Chinese companies, Huawei and Co, came and completely changed the game. And so in Nigeria, for example, all of the bulk of our telecoms infrastructure is built by, is by Chinese companies. You know, so if it makes business sense, there's nothing to stop. Tolu, and, and picking up very much on that, and also inspired by your point about how um, Africa, well, Nigeria, mm. pretty much skipped landlines. Mm. There is an argument out there, there's a thought out there, that, that in fact, Africa or large parts of Af Africa essentially missed out on the Industrial Revolution. Mm. Um, and the digital revolution is something, because it's much more meritocratic it's in a very important way, that Africa can forge ahead without the restrictions that were placed upon it and also without the disadvantages that perhaps exist anyway. Yeah. Is that something that makes you very hopeful about Nigeria and Africa's future? Absolutely, absolutely. Um, uh, so to, to go back to the landline, sort of landline mobile phone technology, there, were, you know, there, there was very little legacy landline technology to kind of hold us back. You know, essentially mobile phones came and within, um, so at the moment in Nigeria, for example, there are about 160 million active mobile phone lines. Um, of course, most people have multiple lines, you know, because, you know, you're, they're not always reliable. So you've got to, um, but, and more and more of these people, more and more of these phones are smartphones, more and more people are coming online. Uh, WhatsApp, uh, is, is, you know, as like in India, it's the same thing in Nigeria, the national technologies. People are adopting these things quickly. Um, and while we may not own the technologies, we didn't invent the mobile phone, but we sure invented ways of using the mobile phone that I think the West had no idea about. So if you talk about uh, Mpesa in Kenya, mm -hmm. um, sending money, you know, via SMS, you know, if you see the ways in which young Nigerians are using uh, WhatsApp, you know, sometimes in quite basic ways, but you can tell that, look, in a few years, there's going to be levels of sophistication that will be uh, amazing. Um, you know, I, I, and so for me, and again, to use the example of how uh, young teenagers, teenagers in Macedonia sort of had an influence on elections in the US, that's what technology does. It's a leveler, it's an enabler, it gives agency to, those, to the guys who, who have been uh, the, the bystanders for a long time. So there's a lot of cause to be hopeful, actually, that um, we've got half of the continent of Africa is young, is below 20. You know, so you have that 600 million young people who are fast picking up technology and who are going to unleash it in ways that the world has never seen before. Thank you. That's an absolutely fascinating um, uh, point. And I think that one of the things, again, that people will take home with them uh, from this discussion. We've only got uh, three and a half minutes left. Uh, I wanted to turn to you, Mark, um, to, the, to the first question. This point about um, uh, trade wars, brinkmanship is part of trade wars, but brinkmanship can knock things over the edge as well, can't it? I mean, things can get out of control. Things can spiral in a way that uh, people don't sometimes expect. I mean, when you just take your... your President of Boeing hat off and look as an observer of the trading system in the, in the world today. Um, are you worried that things are going to go too far, or do you think that actually it's understood by the important powers, the European Union, uh, China, that President Trump's rhetoric is exactly that, and he really isn't going to push things off the end of the cliff? I think to connect the thread from the prior panel to this panel, the prior panel made very clear that there is more multilateralism happening right now with US leadership in the security domain than is being credited broadly. And, and yet, I think in the trade domain to the question, the reality is that the administration has changed the landscape and said that they are going to focus on bilateralism, which is about transactional uh, negotiation and leverage. And so it can get you toward brinkmanship. And that's a very different space than the security. So trade and security are being handled, evidently, in very different ways right now. Uh, and this is one of the pieces of this change. We've talked technology. The role of the US on trade, not security, obviously, is a different dimension. The alternative models in places like China and the like is a different dimension. I mean, all of these create the turbulence that the world's reacting to. And, and so to your question of you know, what are the risks, of course, there are always risks when you get into a space where those bilateral negotiations are forcing questions and demanding changed 
uh, orientation of the playing field to create this fair and even trade uh, outcome that the president's after. From our perspective, obviously, the most important point is the one you, you made. So just to close on it, we are constantly stressing the value of the mutual working together across industries, not in the security domain, but in the commercial domain. And I do believe that both governments, both in Beijing at Zhongnanhai and in Washington, D.C. at the White House, are eyes wide open about the shared prosperity that they enjoy because of the places where their commercial interests overlap and that they will work very hard to try to secure those, just as they did very much in the USMCA. And there's no doubt that if you look at the efforts and the lengths gone to by the trade negotiations from all three countries, they, there was no time for sleep. These were dedicated, committed leaders and civil servants who got their way to an outcome. And the same kind of context exists in the China-US commercial relationship as well. Thanks very much. Time is very much against us. And with so many military people in the room, I dare not mm -hmm. go over. Uh, 30 seconds, uh, Janice, and then 30 seconds. So the US, should, the bystanders I were talking about was Canada, <laughs> all right? And I think that's exactly the position that much of what we've seen over the last few years increasingly drives Canada toward, which is a bystander position with very, very hard choices in front of it. The US MCA was a regional trade, exam, trade agreement that was driven by an imperative to re-regionalize the economy with an explicit attempt, which were, what we see in that agreement is much less than what was asked for in that agreement to constrain smaller allies from doing extensive trade agreements with China. We are seeing a redrawing of boundaries. The Chinese are doing it in their social credit system and the way they're managing data on a scale that's unprecedented, and we are seeing a re-bordering of the world. And, and Janice makes many of these points in her essay. Um, please read it. Um, Rosa, you have the final word. Uh, thank you, thank you. <laughs> um, a couple of quick points. One, um, do I worry about risk uh, of escalation? Um, or unintended consequences very much so, uh, particularly at this moment, because I think one of the costs, has, has, has Trump achieved victories for the United States uh, in, when it comes to trade? Yes, they're short-term victories. I think they come at the expense of long-term security and relationships for the United States. Part of the reason that I, I think we're in a situation of much greater risk right now is that a lot of damage has been done to, mm -hmm. to alliances and partnerships. And just, just the, to use an overused term, I think trust has been eroded. And, and uh, one of the uh, uh, military experts in this room, I won't, I won't name the person, said from a nation that is very closely partnered with the United States, said recently, we want to help you, but we can't help you because we don't understand what's going on and we're constantly being blindsided. And, and that, that's just a, a small piece of it. But when you, when you have a, an environment in which the risk of escalation exists in the first place, just inherently, and then you take away the, the trust of allies and partners who think, well, all sorts of unpredictable things could happen in the world, but at least I know that these allies will communicate with me and that I can rely on them. When you take that away, that the stakes get higher and higher and every single interaction gets, gets more dangerous. Well, thank you very much. I mean, this is a, this is a, a tough, uh, I, I would venture to say this will be the toughest, intellectually speaking, the toughest panel uh, to deal with. It's good, therefore, that we're finishing now and we go off to dinner where you can discuss it more. Um, uh, I'd like to thank, I'd like you all to join me in thanking Mark Allen, Tolan Lessie, uh, Janice Stein, and Rosa Brooks. <laughs>